Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. All right, good day to you. God bless you. Say welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour. Ready to get back in our Father's Word? Hey, we're going to have a kind of a special today. We're going to call it Broken Vessels. These bodies of ours, our Father in analogy uses them as pottery or vessels. And many of you perhaps have a broken vessel. That is to say your life is, you feel it's broken, it's over, things have gone bad. Well, let's study from our Father's Word and see if we can't understand how to fix it. Because certainly there is a fixing, we'll call it, of the broken vessel. Naturally, this is an analogy and it's given in a spiritual sense. But as in all things, as in all things, certainly we have to understand our Father's Word. We have to take the blinders off from this earth age, that is to say, understand from the manuscripts that there was an earth age before this one. Otherwise, you're going to think our Father is very unfair when it comes to vessels, how that some uh, he shapes for one thing and some for something else. You're never going to understand that unless you realize the overthrow of Satan in the beginning and how some reacted there. It falls off of, on them even in this earth age. So, let's lay a little groundwork for that. Broken vessels, a word of wisdom from our Father. We get this from, and we're going to start in Jeremiah chapter 1 and verse 4. Let's see what our Father has to say about Jeremiah. Jeremiah, of course, is one that Yah launches forth, meaning sends out. So he was very proud of him. Why? Chapter 1, verse 4, that great book, Jeremiah, Then the word, and I repeat, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, verse 5, Before, emphasize, before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. I knew who you were before you were ever conceived, Jeremiah, before you ever became flesh or even entered a flesh body. And before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee. Boy, now is that fair? Of course it's fair, because he foreknew Jeremiah. He knew his reactions in the first earth age to Satan's rebellion. Never had, well, we'll continue. I sanctified thee, and I, being our Father, ordained, even foreordained, if you choose, thee a prophet unto the nations. Now, many people would say, well, that's sure pre existence there. Well, actually, there is no such thing as pre-existence. However, there is no other way that you can explain it in English other than using the word pre-exist. And I will explain that simply by saying that once God created a soul, it's always existed. There was no pre to it. There is as far as this earth age is concerned. But as far as a soul, that is to say the spiritual body, and the spirit of a man, that the soul, even Satan's soul, is still in existence, though he's sentenced to death. So understand what I mean. As far as the soul is concerned, the term pre-exist is inadequate, for no soul has ever stopped existing. It has changed bodies from the Heavenly Father sent Jeremiah being known of our father for his um, uh, no doubt wonderful deeds that he accomplished in the first fight, the overthrow at Satan's rebellion when the sons of God, which are those souls, then God chose that one to be a prophet. Why? He knew he could count on him. 
He knew Jeremiah wouldn't wilt at the first confrontation and dry up in the breeze and blow away, that he could cut it. He was a can-do type person, a vessel that God could depend on, having earned, if you would, the right to be foreordained by our Father, knowing that he would be a vessel that God could count on. You know, many times to not understand, as it is written in the third chapter of 2 Peter, that there are three world ages. There was an earth age before this, there is this earth age, and there's one that is coming. The third earth age. Same earth, same heaven, but different ages. In God's perfecting the saints, or that is to say, giving everyone an equal opportunity to accept God or to go with Satan. And you all know where Satan's going. I don't have to tell you. So the choice is always yours. So many times in our lives, People are not aware of the influence that our Father has upon it as He shapes, as He molds. And the clay must be pliable from the first earth age throughout this earth age and the age um, to come that we, that we can understand that our Father is the potter. But the, with the clay specifically being the flesh body. Even as it is written in Ecclesiastes uh, chapter 12, along about verse 6, it stipulates there that ere the silver cord part, meaning that our, our um, souls contact or tie to the flesh body when it snaps, and the pot is broken, that means the vase, the vessel, is broken, this flesh body, then the spirit, which is the intellect of the soul, returns instantly to the Father that gave it, and of course, the flesh back to the grave. Now, however, again, I would repeat, the analogy is that you had better keep your spirit and your soul pliable, whereby God can, cor can correct you through perhaps chastisement at times and mold you into a vessel fit for service. Let's go to the 18th chapter. Let's go directly to the potter's wheel where our Father makes this very clear in simple terms. If you've ever watched a potter work, it will clarify for you and you will uh, understand better what it is our Father is saying here. Chapter 18 in this same great book of Jeremiah, the word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, verse 2, Arise and go down to the potter's house, and there I will cause thee to hear my words. I want you to go down there. I want you to see what's happening, and then I will tell you. Our Father really liked to use object lessons. In other words, the object here will be the potter's wheel. And that wheel... And the forming of that pottery will let you know how our Father touches our lives. And friend, you can certainly believe it. Number one, a lot of people wouldn't have got up and gone. Have you ever thought about that? God can tell a person to do a thing. A lot of people wouldn't today. The obedience of Jeremiah is a good start. But then we know, don't we, from chapter 1 we just completed, that God knew Jeremiah would go. He could count on him. That's why he sanctified him before he even entered, or while he was in the womb. Chose him even before he was in the womb. Verse 3, Then I went down to the potter's house, and behold, he wrought a work on the wheels Plural, Eben and Oben, two wheels. One wheel below that you could pedal or turn in one shape or the other, and a wheel resting above that it turned in a circular motion by the action of the wheel below. They were stones. Eben and Oben mean stones in the Hebrew tongue. With the clay centered in the 
Eben, the Oben, and the potter's hands touching and shaping and forming, that that he would as the wheels turned. Beloved, that's life. And if you can look at your life and simplify it to this extent, to realize that many of your troubles, when that clay is touched improperly and it falls from shape, that as long as you are pliable in the Word of God, that He can remold you. And when that kink in the clay, I'll call it a kink, well, let's call it a warp. Let's say that, that um, the wheel turned a little fast and some of the, by centrifugal force, some of the clay, uh, this is not a good example, but I'll continue with it, would form, or, or by centrifugal force, it would be forced outward until it was a misshapen vessel. Sometimes life gets that way. We allow ourselves to be misshaped spiritually speaking. We get in troubles. But when you go to the potter, our Father, with sturdy hands He can touch as that Eben and Oben turn those wheels, the potter's wheels, and shape that back with a little moisture into a perfect vessel. He can fix it and you can believe it. That's why God would use this op, uh, object lesson whereby you could see the shaping and forming. Now listen to the words of God, verse 4. And the vessel that he made of clay was marred in the hand of the potter. So he made it again, another vessel, as seemed good to the potter to make it. Now, actually for the deeper student, you can see that uh, though the clay actually applies, then there was a marring. When was the first great marring? It happened in the first earth age when Satan rebelled and a third of God's children followed him. These souls, as it is written in Revelation chapter 12, as well as other places indicated of the katabo. Then God himself is in the process of reshaping that earthen vessel whereby it will be approved by our Father because it seeks approval. Therefore, you must seek that approval and you do that because you love Him, not by force, not for a price, but because you love Him. And because He has done so much for us, and when you begin to obey and to follow Him, He will always shape you. Your body is not uh, marred enough, that is to say, your spiritual body, whereby on repentance and forgiveness that God cannot reform it, that it cannot be fixed. And this is how it's done. By returning to the potter's house, getting on that wheel and allowing the clay that is your body to be shaped, to still be flexible to the point that it can be molded, can be changed. And certainly our Father can do that. Then verse 5, Then the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, verse 6, O house of Israel, cannot I do with you as this potter, saith the Lord. Behold, as the clay is in the potter's hand, so are ye in mine hand, O house of Israel. This is given on a national sense. I would have you know that God caused the house of Israel to part, or allowed it to part from the house of Judah. And he still molds both. He still forms both. But this also has an individual aspect in as much as through Christ you can be reshapen at any time, remolded, made new, have a fresh start. And sometimes um, when we may be playing the, the, the role of a garbage can, you might be reshaped into a flower pot. Or even better yet, 
a flower vase. Verse 7. At what instant, think about that now, this is God's Word, at what instant I shall speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom to pluck up and to pull down and to destroy it. In other words, I can do that in an instant if I so choose. Just look at the potter's wheel. He could crush it if he so chose, or he could shape it. He has that much control. That's why that you can count on prophecy coming to pass exactly as it's written, because as God uses Jeremiah here, then he uses entities that succeeded or were subject to have been foreordained, not because they're any better than anyone else, but because they chose to please our Father even in the first earth age, and there's no, I must, ins, I must insist, there is no reincarnation in that. No entity, no soul shall live through this earth age more than one time, for it is given for every man to die but once. The flesh to die once, the soul to die once, if it chooses that uh, in the millennium period. but simply shaped into a new form. And God has the ability to pull down, to build up, to tear, if he so chooses, and also to love. Verse 8, if that nation, I like to insert the word but in English between these verses because in the Hebrew it does carry. But if that nation against whom I have pronounced turn from their evil, I will repent of the evil that I thought to do unto them. In other words, I want, you to, I want you to see there is a reverse side to the Eben and the Oben, that is to say the wheels, that the potter himself can change. He admits it, that he can change his opinion of you, or even a nation, that upon repentance and upon asking forgiveness, our Father will, I mean, He's more than willing to forgive you. All you have to do is ask and have that change of heart. He wants, even wants, to forgive you when you fall short. He did not choose to waste his time on a potter's wheel throwing away mortar or mud or clay simply to have something to do. He likes to take pride in his work. I said he likes to take pride in his work. Perhaps I will word that he chooses to be pleased by his work. But when our Father shapes a pot and gives it free will, then our Father's responsibility stops at that line because only an entity or a pot with free will can originate natural and genuine love within itself without any outside influence and or force. Did you know that? Only you, only you, whatever your name may be in God's eye, whatever it is, that's what it is in His eye, only you can generate the love He chooses, and God will not interfere with that, that will reach out to Him and say, Potter, thank you for having formed me. I love you, Father, in other words. But at the same time, I must remind you again, even our Father on repentance can change. When he might have thought to pick up that piece of clay and fling it to, to destruction, if that clay turns to him with its love that generates within itself, then it pleases him. And even he will change his mind on your repentance. Uh, and he will repent 
perhaps from what he had thought to do. Verse 9, And at what instant I shall speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom to build and to plant it. But, verse 10, if it do evil in my sight, in other words, I may have promised I would do this or that with that nation to the good. But if it does evil in my sight, th that it obey not my voice. That's very important to our Father. Well, where is His voice? You're reading it. This is His voice. Then I will repent of the good wherewith I said I would benefit them. So, repentance is very essential in your life if you expect to be a vessel that is not broken or cracked or, that is to say, have as much trouble in this life. It's up to you. Everyone makes their own way. And it is better to be a beautiful piece of pottery pleasing to our Father than to be a broken vessel and I know it is so easy once you receive a, to have been such a beautiful vase and to have received through damage a huge crack or jagged break. It can be very damaging to one. I just think world is over for me. I just have, don't know. It, you can see how silly you are when you think that when you know you're still on the wheel. God can fix it. And you show lack of love and trust in Him. When you, as a broken vessel, feel or doubt that He cannot fix your soul, give you an entire new design, if it be pleasing unto him and to you. But he promises at the same time, and I don't want you to overlook that, that if you displease him, <laughs> you're in a bad place while you're on that wheel. And he's the potter, and certainly that is how it is, my friend. I know that in this generation, many people do not believe the effect and influence our Father has on this world when even it is written in a high-tech, well-educated um, peoples, that people this earth today, then how ignorant they are concerning our Father's Word. It is sad, but it is written as well. And so it comes to pass. Verse 11. Now therefore go to, this was Jeremiah's purpose as a prophet, go teach, speak to the men of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, saying, now this is not Israel, it's Judah this time, Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I frame evil against you. Yes, God does that. I am molding evil. I'm shaping it on this wheel saying, Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I frame evil against you and devise a device against you. Return ye now every one, now it goes to entities, individuals, from his evil way, and make your ways and your doings good. Take the right path, walk in the way, which is to say the correct path. Verse 12, And they said, There is no hope, but we will walk after our own devices. We'll make our own way, our own path. And we will, everyone, do the imagination of his evil heart. Boy, how people like to work out their religions according to this man or according to that man. Why would anyone want to listen to this man or any other man when they have the Word of God? You might say straight from the horse's mouth, you can read it straight from God. Why would you allow some man-made religion to interfere with that perfect communication that you have with the potter that actually has his hands touching you in the molding process? 
it can cause him to simply, as it turns, go. He, can, he has a point at which he can flatten the clay. And when you turn from him, you're asking for it. I might ask you, many of you have experienced taking uh, classes in pottery. What do you do when a piece of pottery messes up and before you bake it? If it really, I mean, you really, it just messes up. And so are you going to go ahead and put the finishing process on it or are you going to toss it or remold it? You know the answer. Verse 13. Therefore, thus saith the Lord, ask ye now among the heathen. You even go to those that have never studied the word, who hath heard such things. The virgin of Israel hath done a very horrible thing. Even they would know better in what is natural. 14. Will a man leave the snow of Lebanon? That means that beautiful, clear, pure water of the melting snow that comes from that mount which cometh from the rock of the field, and you know who the rock is, or shall the cold flowing waters that come from another place be forsaken? Are they going to dig a cistern and allow strange water to run in? Men do that in religion and think nothing of it. Have you heard of anything new today? Heard any new way to worship that I may please or feel pleased within my own heart to be lifted. Hey, I don't care how lifted you are in your heart. If it isn't pleasing to God, you got troubles, friend. All you're doing is allowing the clay or the flesh to get on a high. And so it is. Be careful, friend. Verse 15. Because my people hath forgotten me. They have burned incense to vanity. Oh, they're religious. You know, burning incense is a very religious thing. But vanity is emptiness. And they have caused them to stumble in their ways from the ancient paths to walk in paths in a way not cast up. This means, do you know how you build a roadbed? You cast up a a foundation and it is solid. And he said, they get off out here on paths that don't even have a solid foundation to them. It's shaky. And they think that's great. What is he saying? If you're not on the path of God from his word, that that is written shall come to pass exactly as it's written because the potter has his hand on the clay. And anytime you get off that path on a man-made path, that some religious person, usually with a doctorate, has invented to worship or burn incense, something holy, holy, holy. Usually, when somebody says do something holy, they start begging or passing a plate. That's usually what it ends up to ultimately. Man's religion, rip them off, rake them down, and show a few pictures of a few scrawny cattle out some pasture and say you're going to give them new life. And you never hear it said that only God can do that. Be careful, my friend, and don't let some, some idiot insult you, your credibility, or your ability to think for yourself from God's Word. This has nothing to do with those that honestly care for certain missions. But when they make a duty out of begging, God's never, missionary or otherwise, told anyone to take a begging bag. So nine times out of ten, you're looking at a phony. Verse 16. To make their land desolate and a perpetual hissing, every one that passeth thereby shall be astonished and wag the head. Uh, they're, at, they're going to chuckle and struggle and, and uh, um, at their funny religion, maybe even laughing, <laughs> but never teaching God's word. 
Do you think that pleases God? What do you think the potter is going to do? 17. I will scatter them as with an east wind before the enemy. You think he won't do it? He did. He scattered those ten tribes 200 years before brother Judah would go into captivity of Babylon. I will show them the, the back. I will show them my back in the manuscripts. God's turned his back and not the face in the day of their calamity when they try to make their own religions and their own ways. Forget it. I turn my back upon them. We're going to pick this up in the next lecture, but I want to say a few words about the broken vessels. Do you know why we have the potter's field? Because Christ was sold for 30 pieces of silver. And in that 30 pieces of silver was purchased a field. Do you know where it is? It's just outside the potter's gate. And just outside that potter's gate is the potter's field. When a vessel is broken, and in life, unfortunately, it happens when you have a beautiful piece of pot or pottery, sooner or later someone gets careless, and it's broken, and it was thrown in that potter's field, just potsherd, that's all. But Christ's blood that purchased that field can put any piece of property, any piece of vessel, rather, or pot, back in perfect condition. So, in the next half of this lecture, you'll find out exactly how it is that we repair the broken vessels. It's no accident, absolutely no accident, that the potter's wheel was utilized by our Father from the very beginning to illustrate even down to the crucifixion and the 30 pieces of silver which would purchase that field that would make it possible upon repentance and love that you could be rebuilt all over again. You know, it was bought for the poor. It was bought for the outcast to be buried in the potter's field. And as we have that great slogan, and give me your poor, your tired, your weary, at this great nation, that potter's field is a far greater and freer land than that that says, give me your needy, give me your poor, give me those that are distressed, at the ways of this world, the Sodoms and Gomorrahs that are, exist today, even in this century, in this civilized society, that He is able there, when you come into His field, to be remolded into something special. So don't ever be depressed. Don't ever give up. Even though the vessel you are is broken, it can be fixed. We'll look into that in the next half of this lecture. All right, bless your heart. You listen a moment, won't you please? The book of James. James is a book that I know you'll enjoy because it is written when you rightly divide it to those that are scattered abroad. That's to say the 12 tribes, the 10 tribes scattered abroad being very specific in your freedom of Christianity, the repentance, uh, giving much personal instruction as far as controlling our thoughts and finding peace and giving us those parameters wherein Christianity uh, defining those things that come from the Word of God. Example, that uh, bitter and sweet water cannot come from the same spring. Well, from God's Word, you should not have both either. The practice of healing brought forth in this book of James. I know you're going to like it. James, that great book of instruction. 
All right, bless your hearts. There we are back again. Say, let's have the 800 number if we may. 1-800-643-4645. That number is good from Puerto Rico, throughout the U.S., Alaska, Hawaii, and all over Canada. If the spirit moves and you have a question, share it. Please never ask me a question concerning another church, denomination, uh, or individual. Let's, let's think positive and let's teach positive. Though we're going to teach firm and boldly. Um, we can do our Father's Word without naming individuals or religions or so forth. And if the shoe ever fits, just put her on and wear it. That's the way to do it. Okay. Those of you that listen by shortwave around the world at this time, it's always good to hear from you. Your announcer will give you our mailing address at the end of the hour. You got a prayer request? He's your Father. He loves you. He's there by the wheel. Do you need reshaping a little bit? And, and I'm speaking in a spiritual sense, beloved. Do you need a different attitude? And has depression slipped upon you? Then know in His name the potter can fix it. But you've got to be pliable in His hand, which means you must seek earnestly His word anxiously willing and able to open your eyes and your ears to the truth that you can hear what the Father saith to you in that reshaping. So around the globe at this time we go to him, the potter. Father, we ask that with thy gentle hands, Father, that you mold um, and those in repentance, Father, give them that hope and sure knowledge that you are our Father and that you love us. Thank you for that touch in Yeshua, Jesus' precious name. Amen, amen. Okay, and let's see what kind of questions we have here today and we'll get into those. And we're going to go to Aaron in California and it's a nine-year-old lad. Why did Jacob deceive his dad by putting hair on his arm? And how did Jonah survive three days in the belly of the whale? Well, all right, Aaron, those are good questions for a nine-year-old. Number one, read the last verse. Read the last verse in the first chapter of Jonah. And you will see there that God spoke and this fish came into being. In other words, God prepared a fish, doggone, uh, whereby Jonah could exist three days without dying. Why? It was a type of Christ. That Christ would go into the belly of the earth for three days and three nights. But he would not die, for he rose. Um, and that being the case. And the first part of your question, Jacob was not deceiving his father necessarily for when you go to Genesis chapter 27 you will find there that God stated that the younger and in Genesis 25 as well the mother would be told in your womb you have two nations and the elder shall serve the younger it was God's plan that Jacob have the birthright because Esau uh, God hated him. God hated Esau. And um, incidentally, in the next part of this lecture, we'll be getting into that as well. So listen closely. But God, it was God's word that caused it to happen. He did, it was, it, it is that to save our people, uh, Jacob would take the leadership because Esau he never cared about our heritage. He was always running around with strange women and other things, not fit to be or to prepare the lineage through which the Savior would come. So God got rid of him, all right, uh, in the sense as far as the protector of the faith is concerned. Okay, Kathleen from Florida. I'm married to a drunkard and a drug addict. Every time I try to tell my kids about Jesus and God, and he makes fun and says there is no God. Is it okay to divorce this man? Well, my dear, 
a wise person can never give advice to an individual concerning divorce or anything of that nature unless they know both sides. I could only say, I think that you should read in 1 Corinthians, the seventh chapter, and see if that is not a comfort to you. Okay? Okay, we have Audrey from California. Do the remnant bow a knee to Satan for a short time? I cannot find this in Scripture. Also, I, they do not. The remnant does not. Okay? Number one, well, enough said. Also, I always thought the remnant were sealed after Satan was on earth, not before. Please clarify these questions and document them for me. I love your teaching. God bless your ministry. Well, he sure does bless our ministry. He really does. Uh, you are using the word remnant in a little different way than is fitting God's documentation for what happens here. There is the remnant, and as is written in Romans chapter 11, they are those that passed on the truth, torch to torch, but died before the spurious Messiah came. After the spurious Messiah comes, then you have the elect and the very elect. In numerology, the number 7,000 is used for the very elect in Romans chapter 11. And the 144,000 in the seventh chapter of the great book of Revelation, we find in the 44th chapter of Ezekiel that they do bow a knee, or they go astray when, when um, the children do. But naturally, which means they go astray at first when the false Messiah appears, but then they turn back to the true God because of the witness of the very elect. Thus, in, in the spiritual body, when we are all changed, they are called virgins because they go into the spiritual body, body full aware of who the true Messiah is. I, I hope that clarifies it a little bit. Think about it. Uh, Marcel from Marcel from Indiana, Marcella. Um, Marcel, I bet that's Marcel. Okay, I love your teaching. You often quote that there's nothing new under the sun, and I believe that. But with the crack and drug epidemic of the world, where would it take? Where would it talk about this in the Bible? Uh, before Noah and the flood, how can we get uh, rid of the drugs? Well, it's coming, don't worry. And it's always been written in God's Word. I want you to do me a favor. I want you to take your, your um, Strong's Concordance and I want you to look up the word sorcery. Sorcery or sorcerer. Sorcerer is parkeos in the Greek, and it's where we get our word pharmacist, and it means drugs. A sorcerer that gives you dreams and visions by injecting you or feeding you or smoking in front of you drugs. So there, this drug dealer has been in God's Word, and he says they're all going to hell uh, with a one-way ticket. What happens to the sorcerers? That's a drug dealer. All right? No problem. Um, Clementi, from, there is nothing new under the sun. First chapter of the great book of Ecclesiastes. Uh, Clement, uh, Clement uh, I'm going to say Clementi from Mexico. Uh, can Satan hurt us physically? Question. Even if we're close to God. No, he cannot hurt us physically unless we allow him to. That's why we always anoint our home, our casa, our family. And uh, in anointing, we order in the name of Yeshua Messiah, Hosi, the Savior, out total, that we order in the power of that name anything negative from our life, from our home, and... Um, Certainly, Satan cannot physically hurt you in that sense. His evil spirits only have the possibility to bug you if you let them, but you have power over them by ordering in the name. All right, Angela from North Carolina. I'm a grown woman and I suffer from depression. My mother wants me to live with her. 
Would this be a sin since I'm grown? No, no, Angela. We, sometimes we all are ill, and that's what we have parents and family for, is to take care of each other. Never, never think that that is a sin. You allow your mother to help, all right? Um, Marla from Massachusetts. I've heard you say there are no unsolved mysteries on earth, that all murders and so forth, uh, when they die, will be judged by the Father and pay for their sins. If this is what happens, what is the use of repentance? I thought if you repented, your sins were forgiven, as if they never happened. Please explain why one should repent if they're going to pay for their sin anyway. Well, we're talking about murder here, dear. You know, if you sin a sin that severe, one pegged by God as it is in Deuteronomy 18, and you send the soul of that person by murder back to the Father, then before you can be forgiven, that person must forgive you. All right? And that's what you have to take up with when you arrive at the Father's feet. Because that person is the person you murdered is there waiting for you. And they will have a great deal to say about forgiveness. So if you ever decide to murder someone, I don't care how many times you repent, you're still going to have to face that one at the feet of God because you sent them there. You can't just take somebody's life spill blood as did Cain of a brother with that blood crying from the ground and think repentance is going to get you out of it. It isn't. It's not God's way. Yes, God will, may forgive under the blood, but you still have to face the person you murdered. Will they forgive you? Well, I don't know. Um, I would say the chances of it might be a little slim in some cases. People are not really that high on murderers who premeditate. I'm not talking about accidental deaths or anything of that nature, okay? That's up to the Father. That is written. It is the Word. And you find the documentation in Deuteronomy chapter 19. Tina from Texas. Ezekiel's cherubims have four wings. Revelation and Isaiah, the cherubims have six wings. Why the difference? Well, there was, the wings are symbolic, number one. You have the wings of the two cherubims on the ark. They only had two wings, one set, right? But that is symbolic for us to see. The wings of Ezekiel was a formation of vehicles, all right, um, and so forth. There were just more in one formation than another, all right? You got it? The wings are... Ezekiel's uh, crude attempt to describe something was flying like a bird. Uh, Angie from Georgia, I homeschool my children. We also do a homeschool Bible study, but they teach the apple theory, tree theory rather. Are you going to come out with any books for children with the correct Bible teachings? This would be so helpful. In the meantime, what should I do? I enjoy and admire your truthful teaching. Well, thank you very much. And guess what? In, I don't want to make a promise, but in about a month, not much more, we will have the first in a series of children's teaching books. And they're going to be very colorful and very helpful. I'm looking forward to it. Please don't anyone call and try to order one. They're not available. I don't know what the printing is going to be exactly. And just wait. I'm just saying you're going to be helped in teaching children the truth from God's Word. Okay, Gilbert from Canada. Is it written anywhere in the Scripture that we are not to dwell on the last days? My religious friends tell me this. If it is written somewhere, I'd like to know where. Well, do you allow your religious friends to lead you? Or do you allow God to lead you through His Word? I would say uh, you better be very careful because your religious friends are lying to you. We are never 
uh, admonished to not dwell on the last days. It is God's prophecy, and you are to meditate upon it. That's what God's Word states. That does not say you are to become a religious fanatic, but that you are not to be biblically illiterate and that you should study and meditate upon the Word whereby you become knowledgeable in the book of Revelation as well as all other prophecies. Usually, Gilbert, this saying is done by some so-called man of God that is so ignorant he couldn't teach the book of Revelations if he wanted to. It's just a good cop-out, all right? Get rid of religious friends and get into the Word of God. Christianity is not a religion, it's a reality. Uh, Bob from uh, Mississippi, I guess that is. It's not very clear. Why don't you observe the true Sabbath? I do. Whatever gave you the idea, I don't. Every day, every day, as God lengthened the day uh, from one day whereby the battle could be won, so it is. Are you a child of night or are you a child of day? You'd better read 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and make your mind up. We're in one day, a true Sabbath, until Christ returns. We'll grow up and mature. Read Colossians chapter 2 and be very careful with an open mind. Read it. Bernice from Nevada. Where does it say in the Bible that the tribulation will happen first? Well, Bernice, there are two tribulations and naturally the first tribulation is going to happen first, okay? which is to say Antichrist will appear on earth before Christ's tribulation comes. Now, are we to worry about God's tribulation? He's not mad at us. He's not angry at us. He's angry at the enemy. God will never touch his anointed, and he orders Satan not to either. Okay, Carol, from your, it's written in, in Mark chapter 13. Catch both, all right? Carol from California, my daughter married a non-believer. How can I convince her to get back into church? Set the example. You got to be very careful uh, uh, how you interfere into a married couple's life. You do it by example. Uh, I would say read, as I told a, a lady earlier, 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Take advice from that, but most of all, set the example by showing her how blessed you are, and if she continues drifting away from church, how cursed her family will be. You don't have to emphasize it or nag about it, all right? And I know you wouldn't do that, would you, Carol? Of course not. Daryl from California. Is it possible to get to know God without going through the Bible? I've never read the Bible, but I feel like I know Him. Is this possible? Well, Daryl, you pose quite a question. Let me ask you, to, to know our Father is to understand His Word, and it's, it's very simple. But do you know what? It's, it, you're asking a question, could you get to be a dentist without going to um, a school of dentistry? How about it? I've never been to a school of dentistry, but I believe in dentists. How about letting me drill on your teeth, Daryl? All right? Would you like that? You know, I'm sure I, I could give you, you know, we could just slug you right in the face and that'd kind of kill the pain from that and just drill away, you know, very crudely. Expertise comes from study and uh, certainly not to be confused with an agnostic, but we are to be wiser than the serpent and there's no way you're going to gain that except you get into God's Word. My answer to you is no. How would you know what to do if you had never read the prophecies to help or assist God? You wouldn't. You'd be ignorant. All right? Biblically illiterate. Tagging, branding so. That's what you would be. Oh, you can know a God exists and believe that, but you don't love Him or you would love His Word. Period. Todd from Michigan. I am divorced and met a Christian woman. I go to church, but some churches won't marry me, but they will marry a murderer. Why does God convict me of this? Does he want me to go back to her? I don't understand. Well, do you think, are you confusing God and some church? 
God is not a church. God's Word is God's Word, and you've got some churches that are giving you bum information. All right? Some churches like to play one-upmanship so they can have a class that is below them that they can make themselves feel good by saying, you are a divorcee. And I would say if they were a student of God's Word, God's Word states if you sin, repent, and I don't want to hear about it again. I wonder why the church does. You see, God doesn't want to hear it. Through Christ, Christ can forgive all sin except the unforgivable sin, and that's certainly not divorce. And I would say you're listening to the wrong so-called church. It's not a church where they play one-upmanship and put chains on God's hands and pillows that He can't save you and forgive you. All right. If you want to listen to them, go ahead. But I would, hey, kiss them off. All right. I, I, by that I mean be sweet to them, but why listen to them? Okay, Sandra from Illinois. Ecclesiastes, uh, where can I find when you die, your spirit goes up to heaven? Please document. Well, it's real easy. It's Ecclesiastes 12, 7, all right? And we're out of time. I love you all a lot because you do enjoy studying our Father's Word in more depth. How sad it is in this modern time that people do not study our Father's Word with more clarity and, um, and seek it and thirst for that water of life. He wants you to live, so live. He loves you because you enjoy His Word. All right, we're brought to you by your tithes and offerings. If we've helped you, you help us keep coming to you. Once you do that, now, most important, you stay in His Word. Every day in His Word's a good day. Do you know why? Jesus Yeshua is the living Word. Hearing God's Word with understanding will change your life. You have been viewing the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. If you are interested in obtaining more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer includes the Mark of the Beast audio tape, a newsletter with a written Bible study, a complete audio tape catalog, and a list of reference materials available through Shepherd's Chapel. You may request our free introductory offer by telephone. Call 1-800-643-4645, 24 hours a day to request the offer. You may also request by writing, Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. That's Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. We invite you to join us and serious Bible students around the world for our next in-depth Bible study, Monday through Friday at the same time. Thank you for watching and God bless you.